Jan Hicks. Jan Hicks Creates here coming back at you with the basics of cross stitch lesson two. Not four, two. Today we are going to be getting into stitching. We're gonna take a look at our kit, break down the anatomy of a kit, um, break down the anatomy of a chart, and then start talking about how to actually stitch. So, I'm gonna be using this chart. I actually don't have a kit, so, but I'm still gonna be able to tell you what a basic kit looks like, what's in a basic kit. Um, but I did print off this chart. It is a free chart from Tiny Modernist. I will link it below if this is something you would like to use to start with. You would have to kit it up yourself. I will be doing a video, probably the next one I do, I hate to make promises because I might change my mind, but probably the next one I do will be talking about how to kit up something yourself. But this is what I will be using in today's video to talk through woo, all the basics of cross stitch. We have a lot to, to cover today, so I'm gonna go ahead and just jump right in. If you have a kit and you want to kind of follow along or if you want to go and print out this chart, Go ahead and pause the video and go and do that. Um, so you will need your kit with your fabric, your floss. You will need a um, pair of sharp embroidery scissors. And I would like you to grab, there it is, a pin, just any type of pin um, that will help us keep, uh, keep a place, uh, um, help us keep track of the middle of the fabric um, when we're threading needles and counting and stuff. So go ahead and grab that stuff and then come back and I will be waiting here for you. I am going to flip the camera around so you're actually looking down at my work table. I am back up in my loft today because I wanted to be sitting at my work table, which gives me kind of more state, space to have everything laid around and to show you. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Okay, friends. So we have the materials from our kit in front of us. And as I mentioned, I don't actually have a kit. Um, but every kit that you buy out there is going to have some basic materials. It's going to have the fabric. It is most likely going to come with a needle. It will have the floss and it will have the instructions. Your kit is going to have lengths of floss already cut. So they have cut off, not exactly what you need. Hopefully they've given you a little bit of an overage of what you will need to complete the design. But you won't have full skeins of floss like this. You will just have lengths cut and organized in some way. So that is a, what the basic kit looks like. This cloth is called Ada. There are different counts of fabric of Ada cloth and other cloth. And I will be doing a separate video just on fabric to, to talk about all the different types of fabric that are out there. But for now, we're just going to talk about Ada just a little bit. So Ada is the fabric that has the squares woven into it. And as I said, there are different counts. And what the count mean means is that there are a certain number of squares per inch. This is a 14 count Ada, so that means there are 14 of these squares in an inch. You have 11 count, you have 16 count, you have 18 count, so all of those mean that there are that many of squares per inch. I would say the majority of basic kits usually use 14 count Ada. And it's a great place to start because it does have the squares so the squares are going to guide you as to um, where you place your X's. The holes are nice and big, so they're easy to see. It is a great place to start when you're just starting to cross stitch. So let's look at the chart and talk about what we see in the chart. Your chart in a kit you get is probably going to be in black and white instead of in color like this particular one is. It varies from company to company, whether the, the chart's in black and white or color. I would say more of them 
are in black and white, but it's not like I have a lot of exposure to all the different kits out there in the world. So take that for what, what it's worth. So usually you're going to get a picture of the finished piece. Usually that's on the front of the kit, so you can see what it is, just like these ones here. I will be doing the um, giveaway at the end of the video, so stick around for that if you've signed up for, for the winning. And then you have the instructions, the guide to the chart type of thing. Now, a, a full kit probably will have some basic instructions on how to do the actual stitching. I am your instructions today. <laughs> so here is our color list and our, our symbol list. So what we're seeing here is the symbol and the color number of the thread. Now this particular kit does have um, the, the colors listed for both DMC and Anchor. These are two different brands of cotton floss. By and large, most companies, well, most cross-stitch and most hand embroidery is done using DMC. However, in kits, it is not usually stated what brand of floss they use. But it will have, of course, the, um, the color and the symbol, um, some kind of number, possibly the description of the color. Over here, we have the number of stitches used in that color and exactly how much thread those stitches used, exactly being what this person that stitched this or that they created this used. It's basically what the computer generated. Your, your mileage probably will vary depending on how you stitch, what direction you go in, um, how much you cut off in the end. I mean, there's all kinds of variables. But anyways, this isn't really important in a kit, so most of this information isn't going to be here. But you will have, like I said, the symbols, the colors, and maybe the name. Down underneath this, this um, table, we have X cross stitch uses two strands of embroidery floss, and the back stitch uses one strand of embroidery floss. Now, if we look back up here at the chart, you can see this particular color, number 321, which is Christmas red, has both the symbol and this slanted line. The symbol is where it's used in the chart, and the slanted line is noting that that is the color used for backstitch, and that's what these lines are here. Most patterns and most kits do tell you what the stitch count is. So 39 stitches wide and 67 stitches high. So 39 going this way, 67 going this way. And this gives you a good idea. As you, as you stitch more and more, it's going to give you a good idea of just how big the chart is. And as you stitch more and more, you're going to get a better feeling for how big of a chart do I want to stitch? Do I want to keep it under 100 stitches, whatever direction, or am I willing to go up to 300 stitches? There, is, there, is, there are charts out there, huge ones, that are like a thousand some stitches. There is something for everybody and you will find, you will come to learn what your preference is. Stitches used, cross stitch and back stitch. And then most designs, I won't say um, the kits will, because since the kits are giving you specific fabric to work with, they're only gonna tell you the finished size for that fabric provided in the kit. But most other just patterns are going to give you an idea of what the design size, the finished size will be on different counts of fabric. This particular designer tells us on 11 count Ada, it's three and a half by 6.1 for the finished size. On 14 count, which is what I'm using, 2.8 by 4.8 inches. And then on 16 count Ada, it's 2.4 by 4.2. So again, that gives you an idea when you look at this, you think, okay, how big do I want to deal with? What finished size am I, am I comfortable with? Or even like, I want this to go in a standard sized frame. Which one would be best for that? 
like a four by six, you might wanna do this and you'll have some room around it for matting or just putting, putting the extra fabric. So let's talk about the extra fabric and the fabric in general. Most, well, every time you do a, a pattern, you are going to allow for extra fabric outside of the amount that the design is going to take up. So this is 14 count Ada. The finish size is 2.8 inches across this way and 4.8 inches down this way. So you can see that my fabric is, how, what did I cut this? One, two, three, four, five, six and a half by, oh, probably eight. So I allowed extra fabric and why, why that's important is when it comes time to frame this, you will decide how much fabric you wanna have showing between the finished stitching and the frame, whether you mat it or not. And then you have to allow for some fabric to wrap around the back of whatever this is mounted on, which is usually some sort of mat board, and fastened on the back. So you allow extra fabric for all of that. And you allow extra fabric on each side. Okay, so I think that's all the basics I wanted to cover. Now let's talk about how to start. You can see on the chart that there are arrows here, 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 and here. Now this particular designer was very considerate and they continued these lines down from the arrow, across from the arrow. This helps us find the middle. A lot of the times you will only have the arrows at the sides and at the top, and so you have to, have to actually do the, the coming down and the coming over to find that center. We start in the center because that allows us to be sure we've allowed the fabric we need for the framing. No goof ups if you start in the center. Ask me how I know this. <laughs> I don't always start in the center. I'll be doing another video on how to decide when it's okay not to and how to do that. But for now, the basics are we're going to start in the center. Now, how do you find the center on the cloth? Very simple. You're going to take your fabric and you're going to fold it in half. And don't be afraid to crease it. And then you're going to fold it in half the other way. And so there, where that corner is on my little square that I've created, that is the center. And this is why, this is where you take the pin that I suggested you have, and yeah, just stick it in there. Now, are we worried that it's not, oh, exactly, exactly on the lines. I'll move that over one, there's the hole. Are we worried that it may be, may not be exact because this folding thing, you know, it's not exactly an exact science, right? That's okay. So there's my middle. I've gone kind of across two squares there. I'm going to take that pin out. So basically, you just you just kind of decide. Now, if you are off by one square or two squares, is that a big deal? No, it's not because you have allowed enough fabric, enough extra fabric on each side of the design that being off by one square, maybe two squares, but I, you're, you're never really going to be that far off when you're finding the center it's not going to make a difference to having enough fabric at the end. So I have placed my pin there on what I consider the center square. All right, we're gonna set that aside for a moment and go back to the chart. So we can see the center square is here where these lines meet. Now it doesn't meet like in the middle of one of these squares, right? 
we have to decide which one is going to be the center. And again, it doesn't really matter because you have plenty of fabric. One square this way or that way is not a big deal. So I'm going to start, make my center square, this one down here in the lower right. Again, it doesn't matter. Actually, I think I'm gonna make it this one here in the upper right, just so I can show you what it looks like to jump over that square as we're stitching. So the next thing you think about before you start stitching is the direction you wanna go. Now, this is rather unfortunate, maybe a little bit cumbersome that we're starting kind of in the middle of this heart. If it were me doing it on my own, I would probably count down and start down here so that I could, you know, work full rows coming up. It doesn't really matter because you're going to be ending your floss and starting your floss in various places anyway. I am not doing this counting down here today simply because I want to keep it as simple as possible for you when you're starting. We're just going to start in the center and start working. And I will show you various techniques as we go on how to decide to change directions, what that looks like, how to keep your stitches neat as you're doing it, all kinds of stuff to talk about. All right, so we've decided where we're going to start. We have our center marked. Now we're gonna get our floss. And we are gonna talk about two different ways to actually start stitching. Now, I will say there are other ways to start stitching, one of which is called the pin stitch. For those of you um, that may have be familiar with that term, I am not going to show you the pin stitch because I am not, it's not something I use often enough that I'm comfortable teaching. Okay, so let's talk about the floss. All embroidery floss, cotton embroidery floss, is a six ply floss. So what that means is if you look at this, you can see that there's multiple plies there and those multiple plies equal six. The directions told us they want us to use two strands for this. So I need to pull out two strands. Now you might automatically think you're going to grab two strands and pull. No, 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 we don't do that. We pull out one strand at a time. And the reason we pull out one strand at a time is because it helps the fibers to lay side by side together better. I will have additional tips to keep them laying side by side. But for first we're gonna pull out one strand and your, fab, your floss will get kind of bunched up a little bit, straighten it out, grab another strand and pull that out. And don't mind the sound of the garbage truck coming by. I'm gonna set that floss aside. Now, I am going to show you two ways to start. One of which does involve using the two strands and the other of which will just use one strand. But I'm gonna start, again, this is the most basic and the one that is, I would say most generally used and known kind of like this is where we start and then we branch out from here so i have my two strands i never use a needle threader if you need feel you need to please don't hesitate to grab a needle threader and use it i don't even have one handy to show you unfortunately and I will be doing another video at some point of all the gadgets. But anyway, what I do is I have the two strands here and I squeeze them between my two fingers. You have the eye of the needle there. And I just push up. And in general, if the ends are nice and not frayed, it just slides right through the eye of the needle. And of course, this is a big needle. This is a size 24 needle, I believe. So the eye is, is generous. And yes, you do use different size needles depending on what type of, what size fabric you're using. Again, that is something I will be talking about in another video. Okay, so the basic way to start your thread is to, so I, I know that this is my middle here, right? 
that's where I want to start stitching. I'm going to take that out. So the basic way is to bring your needle up in the corner of that center stitch and pull your thread up until you have a tail. And then you kind of hold that tail and you work some stitches and catch the tail. That is kind of the traditional way of starting. I say bollocks <laughs> to trying to hold that. What I do and what I find much easier, I need to put my thumb here so I remember where the center is. I'm gonna be working across this way with my first stitches. I am going to put my needle down over here, come down, and I'm gonna leave that tail sticking up there. And then I'm gonna come up in that bottom corner, pull the thread up, and I still turn it over to make sure I don't pull too hard. But this way, I can kind of keep an eye on that tail and make sure I'm not pulling too hard when I'm making these first stitches. And it just I just find it easier. I don't have to worry so much about um, keeping my finger on those stitches underneath. Now, I am not using a hoop. I actually don't think I own a hoop this small for this fabric. I stitch in hand all of the time. And so I am going to roll this fabric in just a little bit. That means the back of the fabric is up against my hands. So I have better access. I can reach with my left hand the stitches. All right, so I have come up in the bottom left. I'm going to go down in the top right. And then I drop right down, straight down from where I went down and come up again in the bottom left. And you can see that first stitch has caught that tail and you can see on the back, the stitches are straight up and down because I'm going down in the top right, up and the bottom left, so that stitch on the back is straight. So again, down, top right, up, bottom left. I caught the tail on the back. So let's count. I haven't counted to see how many stitches I need. So I'm doing this row here, right? I need to do three and then I'm going to skip one and then I'm going to do four. So down. And then instead of coming up in the bottom right, or I'm sorry, the bottom left of the next square, I am going to go over one and come up in the next, the bottom left of the next square. So that is going to leave that square blank. Now I go down in the top left and I do four more. If I can find the hole. As I'm getting closer to this tail, you can see I have caught underneath with five of the stitches. So I am actually gonna cut that tail off now. And to do that, I get my nice pointy scissors. And I'm gonna pull up just a little bit on that tail. So it's pulled up through the fabric. And when I snip it off, that tail then goes right back down through. So now I can continue on and that tail won't get in the way. All right, so we've come to the end of the row. I'm still going to come back up in the bottom left of the next stitch or the bottom right of the current stitch, but I'm gonna start working my way back. 
So now I go down in the top left or top right. So now I'm starting to work in holes that already have stitches in them, right? So four here. And then I come to the one that I have to skip. So I go down in that top left and come up in the bottom right of that one stitch past the skipped stitch. and continue back to the beginning. So here we are back at the beginning of our row. All right, so let's look at our chart again. Now, I highly recommend as you work on a chart that you mark off what you have done so you can keep track of where you are and what you have left to do. I use a colored pencil and this isn't necessarily the best color for pink, um, you can use a highlighter, I mean, really pen, anything that, you know, that works for you. So you just mark through what you've done. So now we have a decision. Are we going to work down to the next row? Or are we going to work up? Or are we going to go this way? I'm going to work down and I'm gonna tell you why. So there are different things that you will be doing to help keep your stitches neat and even as possible. I could go up in this hole here, but you can see we already have two legs in that, right? You want to try to always go up in what's called clean holes. So that would be here. Okay, coming up in a hole that already has the two legs in it means that you have a greater chance of kind of disturbing and pushing those, those fibers back up so they don't lay as neat. Going down in a hole that already has a couple of legs in it means that you're kind of pushing them down and they're, they're staying neater. Does that make sense? Now, if I decided to work up, I can't go back up in this hole, right? Because that's where I went down. So I would have to come up in this hole if I'm, so, okay, back up. One of the things you always keep in mind is you have to be consistent in your X's. So however you start, whichever leg is the bottom, I'm slanting to the right on my bottom leg and to the left on my top leg. I have to stay consistent across the whole piece. I have to keep the legs organized that way. So you might be thinking, well, can't you just come up in here and go down there? No, because that ends up making your, the organization of your legs different than what you started with. So for me, to keep that bottom leg slanted right, I would need to come up here. But what that means is I come up here, I go down here, and then I have to come across, create a vertical line to come back up here in the bottom in the bottom um, left, I could go up here to the bottom or to the top right, but that means that leg is stretching across two to get there. If I've come up here, gone down here, come up here, go down here, do you see how there's kind of a longer slant? That's more than you need to do. By coming down, I'm always coming up in a clean hole, going down in a dirty hole, up in a clean hole, down in a dirty hole, does that make sense? And I will say that this direction is totally dependent upon the fact that my bottom leg is the right slanting one and my top leg is the left slanting one. If I had switched these, if I worked the opposite so that my bottom leg is left and my top leg is right, then I would want to work up because my I would be ending 
with my, I never do it this way. So let me think. I would be ending with my, um, my top leg coming down here. So I would be jumping up to that hole to start the next row working across. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter which direction you choose to make your X's. It doesn't matter which direction you choose to start. Just what is important is that you stay consistent across the whole piece. Now, you may do this piece in one way, your first piece in one way, and you may decide to try your second piece with your legs slanting in the opposite directions. So that will give you a chance to get a feel for what you're comfortable with, what works best for you. This is the way I've been doing it since I started. So this is what's comfortable for me. So let's look at the, excuse me, at the next row. I dropped down here. I'm going to work across this row. This row is one less than the row above it, and I do not skip a space there. So let's talk a little bit about how to keep our stitches neat. You want to keep it so that your threads are laying parallel as much as possible. Now you will see this stitch here really isn't doing that. It's kind of one on top of the other. So when I see that, I will take my needle and kind of straighten them out so they're laying, they're laying flat. To do it as you're stitching, I want you to keep track of how your floss is laying. And by that I mean, and it, this is something that kind of, I think will develop over time, but you can see my floss is kind of, it, it's laying, so this is flat here, and then it kind of does a little twist here. Let's go ahead and put that needle down through and watch what happens as we pull it through. So it kind of straightens out and I have those two strands of floss laying next to each other. So that's something, again, as, as you go on, you will get a feel for what movements you need to do to keep the floss, the two strands, nice and neat. And of course, this only applies to when you're using two strands. A lot of people, whenever they're manipulating the needle, um, there's a twist that happens when your needle's going up and down. And you can see now the floss is kind of, it starts out even, then it's kind of twisting to the right. When I see that, I put my needle underneath the threads and go down that way. And you can see that kind of leads the threads so that they're laying even. And they end up being side by side when you go down. Again, this is something that as you go on, will become automatic and you will get a feel for. It's just something I want you to be aware of right now. Oops, we were one less. Okay, so we came across one less on this row. So now I'm gonna start back. Keeping an eye kind of on the direction. Do you see how the floss is automatically doing this kind of twist thing that way? I, I help it. I let it continue that way by putting my needle underneath before going down through the hole. Now, another way that you can, and that ended up not being as straight. Another way that you can keep your, your floss kind of lined up side by side is called railroading. And what that means is you stick your needle in between the two strands of floss before you put your needle down through the hole. And that automatically kind of separates the floss and gives it a really nice lay. I don't often do that, um, but I think you'll find if, if your needles are, or if your strands are always twisting, 
that railroading can really help you. If you do find that your strands have twisted, just drop your needle. It's kind of hard to show in the video. Just drop your needle and let it hang from beneath your fabric and that'll untwist it. Now, the stitches. You will notice as I'm stitching that I am not pulling on the thread at all. I do not do this. I don't yank it, I don't pull it. You don't ever wanna pull so hard that you are causing that hole to become misshapen. It's just a matter of bringing it up and kind of letting your, um, letting your floss lay on the fabric without doing any pulling. You don't wanna open up that hole at all. So there's our first two rows. I'm gonna take my pencil and mark off that. And this is really handy too, because you know, if I didn't mark this off, I could be looking at this chart going, okay, where was I? Okay, I did that one with a hole skipped and now I'm down here, you know, it's just easier at a glance, you can see where you are. Now I wanna talk a little bit about um, going off at a diagonal. So I could just go straight down to this row, but I wanna talk about like what to do if your row goes diagonal like this. And that's really, so normally if I were just going straight down, I would just put it up, you know, the next row down and go over. You would just do the same thing if your row's diagonal. You just go over to this hole. Whoops. It's better if I actually look at it and not look at it in the camera. <laughs> and just bring it up and continue on as normal. Now, so far we have only been stitching horizontal lines. There is no reason why I couldn't do this chart in vertical lines as well. So I'm gonna start doing that here, actually. And this works a little bit differently in that, I wanna complete that because I'm gonna go up this row next to those line, that line of stitches. Going vertically like this does take more thread and I will show you why. So I'm still keeping the bottom leg slanted to the right and the top leg slanted to the left. I came up, now granted, I came up here where there were already two legs. If I were starting this on the diag or on the vertical, then I would have started probably here and worked that way. So started with this long line and worked that way. And then I would have come over here and worked the other way. Starting here and working that way would mean when I bring my needle up, it's always coming up through a clean hole because the line of stitches is over here to the left and I'm working to the right. <coughs> But since I'm changing course right now, we kind of are cheating a little bit. It's not really cheating. It's just something to be aware of. You're going to stitch in all kinds of different directions, and it's not always going to be, <coughs> excuse me, it's not always going to be the ideal. So, working vertically, I made my left excuse me, I made my right leaning leg going from the top right to the bottom left. And then I came up again in the top left and now I'm going down in the bottom right. And now I wanna work, continue working up this line. So I am going to actually, I could come over to the bottom left but it doesn't make a stitch as neat as if I come, and, and the problem is when I do that, if I come up in the bottom left and go down in the top right and then finish the X, I end up with my, my thread going down in the bottom left. And that means I, it basically makes me have to go back and forth with where I start the X. And that creates, that, that allows for a, not as neat of a line of stitching as if you keep it consistent. So I go down, I come up in the top right, down in the bottom left, up in the top left, 
down in the bottom right and then jump over that square I just did up to the top right of the next square and do it again. And so you can see how that does use a little more thread because you're going, you're skipping up two squares to get to the next top right square. I really like the line, the way the stitches look when I'm doing this method though. And you know, oftentimes it's the logical way to do your stitches depending on um, you know, what direction you need to go. And part of, part of cross stitch is always deciding where you're going next. You look at these flowers up here. You have a line here. You have these three diagonal here. You have these here coming off at a diagonal. So you have to work these diagonals and probably then come down this straight one and work out here and work out here. One, two, what I wanna do next is um, show you how to end your stitching. And then I wanna show you the other way to start. So ending your stitching, you turn it over and you have all of these stitches on the back. We are just going to take our needle and since I started to come up this line, I don't have as many up here, so I wanna head down here to where there's no thread underneath. This is our starting thread here, caught underneath these stitches. I wanna come down here. I'm just gonna slant down. I'm coming under this here, catching that one. And then I will just do a few more. You need to put it under like three or four, five stitches. You don't really need to catch it under any more than that and then cut it off. So the other way to start is the loop method. This is, I would say, becoming the more popular way to start when you're using two strands, just because it's so much easier. You don't have to worry about tails. I am actually going to, what I wanna do is talk a little bit about how to work areas where you have spaces, a lot of space in between, different angles to work with, jumping away from your main body of stitching, how to handle all of those issues. So let me get another strand. Now when you're doing the loop method, you wanna start with a fairly long strand of, fab of fiber because you are going to be folding it in half. I'm not necessarily starting with a long one because I won't be doing a whole lot of stitching with it. So with the loop method, you have one strand of floss and you fold it in half. Now, there are a lot of people who love this and there are some, this method, and there are some people who disagree with it. The reason they disagree with it, and we're gonna thread our needle just the same way. I pinch the thread in between my thumb and forefinger and just kind of shove it up through the eye. And this is a nice big eye, it just goes right through. So I have my tail of my floss hanging here and then I have the loop hanging further down. So the reason some people don't agree with this way of starting is because when you're taking your floss and folding it in half, you end up with the spin of the fiber going in opposite directions. So, you know, any way, any time, any fiber out there, unless it's a single ply, is twisted in a certain way to be combined. So even though this is a single ply of our floss, of our six ply floss, even the single ply is made up of two much finer threads. You can't really see it and I don't necessarily want to split it. But um, so whenever they're spun, they're spun in a certain direction. So when you're folding your floss in half, you have those directions or that single direction in opposition to each other. Now, 
as just a general needle person um, who's just doing cross stitch for pleasure, will you be able to see that there's a difference? My belief is no. Maybe if you're working with silk, where the sheen is more apparent, you can see that it lays differently. And I actually wouldn't recommend doing the, um, the loop method with silk. I, I, I agree that you can definitely see a, a difference in the sheen with silk. But with cotton floss, unless you're a purist, I wouldn't worry about it. So the fold method. We're gonna jump up here. Now, pretend, let's pretend I've been working and working on this and I have this whole heart finished. Now I'm gonna jump up here to these blue sections and I can see that this blue is two spaces up from the dark color of the heart. We're gonna pretend that this is the dark color of the heart. This stitch here that I just completed, we're gonna pretend that's the top of the heart. So we're going two stitches up and it's actually the third stitch, right? The third square where the first stitch is. So that is this square right here. Again, I want to keep in the diagonal, my lower leg is slanting to the right. I am going to go down in that upper, leg, upper corner and I bring it so that my loop is on top and I bring it almost the whole way through, but not the whole way because I wanna come back up, come back up. <laughs> that hole's there somewhere. Hold on. And I wanna stick my noodle, my noodle. <laughs> I wanna stick my needle up through that hoop, okay? Pull it up. All right, so the loop is actually laying on the top. I don't want it to stay on the top. I want it to be down on the bottom. So I stick my needle back down through that upper right corner. And you can see that loop is just kind of barely there on the top. Give it a little tug. And that pulls it to the bottom. So now, one, two, three, four, five stitches I have to do here. So one, two, and I recommend highly that you make always check your counts. So I have, once I get to my five, and you can see how that thread, like I talked about, that thread is kind of bending that way. I go underneath it and go down. So my threads line up nicely. So I get to my five and just double check. Five, is that what I was doing? One, two, three, four, five. Yes, it is. There's a phrase, count twice, stitch once. Become married to that. Pretty much any time I have any length, like these ones, count twice, count it again, check again, get to the end, check again. Just keep double checking. You will not ever be sorry that you've taken that extra time to double check your count. Because if you don't, and you make a mistake, that's when you have to do something called frogging. Frogging is a term that came about because what we have to do is we have to rip out the stitches. Rip it, rip it, rip it. So that's where frogging came from and nobody likes to frog their stitches. All right, so here's this five done. Now I'm going to go in one on this side, in one on this side, so I only have three to do on the next row. And again, I am going up I actually should have started on this side to do this because when I'm going up, the way I stitch with my lower leg slanted to the right, that would have had me coming up 
in a clean stitch on the next row. As it is, I'm going up in a dirty stitch. And like I said, it's not the end of the world. It's just something to be aware of that helps you to keep your stitches neater. So if at all possible, you always wanna come up. And if you think far enough in advance, <laughs> you wanna be coming up in a clean hole. So let's say that this top stitch of our little pyramid here was actually placed away. How do you handle stitches when you have just single stitches further away? I, my rule basically is if I have a light thread with light fabric, I would just carry and do the stitch. Let's say it's two away. I would just carry and do the stitch. Now, you can't really see that on the camera, but if I hold it up to the light, chances are you can see it. If I have light thread, I would have done it with no problem. The dark thread shows more through the light fabric. It doesn't show quite as much through Ada as it does through linen and other types of fabric, but there's still a chance you can see it. So if this were the case then, what I would normally do, let me get another piece of floss that's a little longer since this one is almost used up. All right, a lot longer. I'm gonna cut this in half. This is too long to deal with. I'm gonna do the loop start again. So whenever you have single stitches that are away from your main body of stitching, if, you're, if, it's a, if it's a color that you're currently working with and it's a light color, go ahead and skip over and do it, especially if you're only skipping over two or three. And in fact, um, yeah, so it, if you're only skipping over a couple, and it's light, go ahead and do it. But if it's a dark color, I would test, hold your fabric up to the light and see if you can see that thread behind it. And if you can, don't take the chance, start a new thread. If it's further than two or three stitches, start a new thread regardless. Maybe five, maybe I'd go up to five, but not much further than that. So again, say we're, we have a single stitch up here, down, Oops, pulled it a little bit too far through. So I have my loop up there on the top. Come up on the bottom. Put my needle up through that loop. And there it's caught. Now I'm gonna go back down through the upper right hole and pull that loop down through to the back of the fabric. complete the stitch. Okay, so how do you end it off when there's just one little stitch? That gets a little trickier, but what I do is I just make sure I take my needle through the, through the um, stitch that's formed by the, the stitch I created, and then I also take it through the stitch that's formed by the creating that loop. So at least my floss is under two stitches and then cut it off. Chances are it's not going to come out. Once this gets mounted, the back is going to be either on sticky board or it's going to be on other mounting board. It's not going to get jostled. It's not going to come out. If, you, if I were doing something that maybe um, saw a little more activity, I don't know, like a pillow maybe, a pin cushion, I might worry more about it. But for the most part, that's secure. All right, so what else did I want to tell you about? Taking out your stitches can be a pain. I'm not going to lie. And there may be times that you just have to take out a couple. And so we're going to 
take that out there. And then just one at a time, use our needle, go under the leg and pull that out. There may be times when you have a lot of stitching that you have to take out. And if that's the case, then I would just very carefully, either with your very pointy scissors or with a seam ripper so that you can just get under the stitch but not catch the fabric, cut it out. That's only if you have a lot to, if you have a lot of, if I just had this to take out, I would just do this method, just taking them out one at a time. When to, when to rip. So I don't, if I have made a mistake, I don't always rip it out. I decide whether, number one, it's something I can live with. Number two, if it's noticeable, and those two kind of go hand in hand, right? If it's noticeable to me, it may or may not be noticeable to somebody else. If it screws up the design, if you can't get the rest of the design to work without fixing it, then you have to fix it. But if it's not all that noticeable, if it's in a wide range of, of um, stitches and it's just one out of place and another one will work in its place, you know, say I did, um, Say I did these three stitches, but forgot the one on the top. And I ended my thread and moved on. If I discovered it later and I was working on like these green stitches here, I would probably just come over with the green and do that stitch in the green and continue on. The problem is I'd have to make sure and do, to do that over there. If I had already done that, then I'd have to come back and do that one in blue. So it really is a judgment, a call on your part, whether it's necessary to the design, if anybody will notice, if it, um, if it can just go on. So that is something you will decide yourself. Let's see. Take this out. I'm going to put this back in and end this thread so we don't have a bunch of threads laying around. Oh, before I do that, actually, I wanted to talk a little bit more, <coughs> excuse me, and to take your, your stitches in and what that means for the neatness of your stitches. So I've talked a lot about bottom leg, top leg, clean holes. Um, don't pull your stitches so that it, you're making the holes in the fabric misshapen, all that. The other thing to think about is when you're making a proper cross stitch, we're going up, we're coming down, and the next leg, we are pulling, not pulling, but the thread, the floss comes down away from, I'm trying to think of the right words. It is coming, kind of bending back on itself so that it leaves that hole move this out of the way, see if you can see the blue through it. It leaves that hole some semi-open. You can't really see. You're, you're bringing the floss away from that hole, but back towards where you started. Does that make sense? Again, we go up and we bend the the floss back away from the hole, back towards where we started to make that first leg. Now, so suppose then that we have a decision to make. We have some of this color up here to the left and we have some of the color down here to the right. Now you might think that, well, if I go to the left, I'm using less floss. 
okay? I am going to start in the upper right on this one. Now, what I, I want you to see what happens here. That leg, you are now moving away from the hole. This is true, but not in the direction back towards where you started. You're away from where you started. And what happens is, is that elongates, number one, it elongates that leg. So it makes it look different from all of the others. But it also, you have brought your thread across that hole. So it's going up here, right? And so on two counts, that particular stitch now looks different from the other ones. Also, because you have brought, you have crossed that hole with your thread, when I go to make other stitches around this that need that hole, I'm going to be going down through that floss, those two strands, possibly splitting them, possibly separating them, possibly pushing them out of the way so that they're even more out of tune with the rest of the stitches. So your better option, even though it's like, well, that's further away, I'm using more floss, that's okay. Your better option is to come down to the right because that way you're pulling open that, that hole, you're not covering up it up with your floss, you're coming back towards where you started, so it creates a nicer line in that stitch, you're not elongating that leg. Yes, you're using more floss, but it's not really that much more, and it, it is, you know, the proper way to go. Now, do I 100% obey my own instructions? No. <laughs> Nothing I do is 100% anything. There are times when I may have three or four stitches up here to the left that I have to do in this color, and that's all that's left of this color in this section. I am not going to start, because the other option would be to start a new strand of floss, to cut this off down here and start a new up here. I'm not gonna do that, especially if I just have like this little bit of floss left in here. I'll just go ahead and do those stitches and know that my stitches aren't as perfect as they could be. Again, that's a call that you will need to make. Just be aware of the proper way, what makes a stitch look good, and the way that's, oh, that's not as good. All right, so now let me take this back down through, tie it off, and let's talk about back stitching. Not tie it off. I don't think I made this comment. You never knot in cross stitch. Never, ever, ever, ever. Unless it's a French knot that you're doing on the front for decorative purposes. We don't make knots on the back because when you're getting it framed and mounted, that'll create a little lump on the fabric that you can see through the front. That's kind of a mess, but this is just practice. Um, and you don't want those lumps, lumps to show through. You want your piece to be nice and smooth and even. All right, back stitch. Let me get, oh heck, let's get some green this time. So back stitch. Back stitch is usually used to highlight, it outlines, it highlights a particular element. This particular pattern told us that we are going to use one strand of floss for the back stitch. So one strand, again, I pinch it in between my thumb and forefinger and put it up through the eye of the needle. So many times you will see back stitch as, and, and that's not how it is in this particular pattern, but I'm going to show you what it might look like. You might have, let's not use blue because the, uh, the color there is blue. You will have lines like this outlining things. This particular pattern doesn't have that, of course. It has these back stitches over here, which is fine, but I wanted to show you multiple ways. So again, I am going to 
start my thread this time, because I only have a single strand, I can't do the loop method. So to start this, I am going to start it by running it under a few stitches on the back. Pull it through, and this is where you will have to hold the tail a little bit. I kind of just clamp it down with my, with my finger. So back stitch is just outlining anything. Up to the left, down to the right, and now a true back stitch is you skip over to the next left hand hole down in the right hand hole. There's also something called a running stitch, which would be just kind of up and down without going far over to the left. Either one works, either one does the job. Back stitch highlights. You will see, there's not as many designers that use backstitch these days. Um, I think mostly because they know people hate backstitch. I don't really hate it because it does amazing things to make your designs pop out. Backstitch is a wonderful tool. So that's really all it is. Now there may be times like on this one where I showed where I put these lines in where you're coming over to, if I have, like, I'm going to jump down here to the pink. If I have this long line here, there are times, and I'll just, I'll do two at a time. I'll come up here and do two at a time. There are times when you might have back stitch that wants you to make more of a diagonal look. Like, for instance, if they had, they had backstitched here, they could either have the lines going along the edge of each square, like this, or they could have it going like this to create a smoother edge. And again, if it were something like that, I would be, you would be doing a diagonal either across like that. There are times when you will see instructions that have you go across two and over one. It really just depends on what, what the designer is looking for. But really, it's all just outlines and you just follow whatever lines the, the designer has put there now. And like I said, in this particular pattern, this is more of a running stitch outline. So for this, let's start here. It's just every other one. And on this one, it's more of a decorative border rather than a true back stitch. Okay. So, look at my notes. I believe, I believe that is all I wanted to cover with you today. If you have any questions, as always, please let me know if there's anything that you felt wasn't clear. I'm happy to, to clarify it for you. If there's anything that you wished I had covered that I didn't, um, let me know. It may be in a future something I already have paid for a future video, or it may be something that I haven't thought of. So don't be afraid to let me know. Now, we want to talk giveaway. We have our two kits. We had, only had nine people sign up for these, but that's okay. So we have Janice Stewart. Janice Stewart won the Home Sweet Home Kit. And Sarah Buckaloo won Hello. 
I am going to be commenting on your comments. I will need you to email me with your mailing address and I will get these out in the mail to you. All right, gang. So the next time, like I said, I think I may, um, next video, next Monday, will be probably on how to, yeah, how to put the, how to put a kit together yourself or the basics of fabric, the different types of fabric. I'm not sure which one makes the most sense to come to come first, but I hope you enjoyed that. Like I said, if you were interested in this pattern, um, I will be putting the link below. Oh, and I one other little tidbit I was going to say. Where'd my needle go? Needle minders. When you're done for the day, don't stick your needle in the fabric. You're taking a risk of, I don't, actually, I don't know whether needles today are made of the material that cause rust, but there are wonderful things out there called needle minders that have magnets on them. You can put them on your fabric and you just lay your needle on there. Whether it's threaded still or not, you can lay it on there. It doesn't get lost. It's with your project, but it's not hooked into the fabric. This particular needle minder is from Mrs. Sadas. Mrs. Sadus.com. I will link her below as well if you're interested in that. So I think that is all, guys. I will see you next Monday for another Basics of Cross Stitch, and I will see you tomorrow for my regular floss tube. In the meantime, you guys have a great day. Know that I love you, and we will talk soon. Bye-bye.